much better sweater today, Gare. <laughs> Started to have second thoughts about coming to this church after that video. No. Good morning, everyone. It's good. Did you sleep at all last night? Well done. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. For the record, for the record, it was over 20 years, but I have done two in-depth teachings from 1 Corinthians 7 on singleness. <laughs> Who would love to hear Gare Jones teach on singleness? My wife and I, uh, who's down here, we fell in love. I was barely 19. She was 17 and a half. Her parents would not give their blessing for um, union until I was at least 21 years old. So we got married the first Saturday after my 21st birthday, which tells you all you need to know about my shadow side. Um, but all that to say, I am a vast repository of wisdom on the single life. Anytime you need guidance, I'm here for you. No. Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Jesus, we just pause and breathe in the reality that we are enveloped in you by the Spirit. Here and now, we ask for grace to be present to our body and our breath, to the moment, to the text we are about to read, to all that you are stirring in our heart and mind in the coming moments. Holy Spirit, come. As you hovered over the waters in Genesis 1, would you hover over this gathering in your name? And would you make something out of nothing? We love you and worship you. Amen. There's a story from the third century AD of St. Serapion the Sindonite, who was one of the desert fathers, which if you're unfamiliar with that, was a group of men, and there were desert mothers as well, who left civilization behind and went off into the desert of North Africa to pursue life with God. In the story, St. Serapion traveled all the way from Egypt across the Mediterranean to the city of Rome to visit a woman who had become widely known all over the ancient world for her radiant holiness. But unlike Serapion and the other desert fathers and mothers, she did not retreat into the desert, but instead stayed in the city, but spent the vast majority of her time at home in her room in prayer. When Serapion found her, he asked her, why are you sitting here? She was quiet for a moment, and she said, I'm not sitting, I am on a journey. Apprenticeship to Jesus has long been likened to a kind of spiritual journey. Not a journey in which we travel over geography, but one in which we traverse the landscape of our inner woman or man. One word for this is spiritual formation, the lifelong journey of becoming who you already are in Christ. And it can be incredibly helpful on this journey, as on any journey, to attempt a kind of spiritual cartography, to have a map, to plot your location, to chart your progress, in order to watch out for potential pitfalls, not take a wrong turn, and not miss key inflection points to move forward. Thankfully, such maps exist. We are not the first people to follow Jesus. Many saints and sages have gone before us and left behind their hard-earned wisdom. Now, it must be said that one, the spiritual journey is not linear, and two, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. 
But there are patterns that we see repeat in biography after biography. If you were to amalgamate all the spiritual biographies of the millions of followers of Jesus down through history and around the world who have gone before us, if you were to put it all into one mass data set, you would start to notice a schema. You would start to see a set of patterns come out. This tends to happen, and then this tends to happen, and then this. Now, academics call those patterns stage theories, and the most basic of all stage theories is what the psychologist Carl Jung called the two halves of life, the first half of life and the second half of life. This theory arguably goes all the way back to Jesus himself. Read with me from John chapter 21. Let's pick it up in verse 18. This is Jesus in a conversation with Peter. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Notice Jesus' uber simple stage theory, when you were young and when you are old. The first half of life and the second half of life. But notice the difference between the two stages. The verbs are active for the first half. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you yourself wanted. But the verbs are passive for the second half. When you are old, someone else will lead you, dress you, and lead you where you do not want to go. Active and passive. Now, this could just be a story about Peter. But all sorts of people have said it's paradigmatic. Peter's story is somewhat similar to your story and to mine. And what Jesus seems to be hinting at here is an inner dynamic that many of us feel as we age. That the older we get and the farther down the path in our spiritual journey we move, the more our apprenticeship to Jesus feels less active and more passive. Put another way, it feels less like something we do and more like something that is done to us. Put still another way, it becomes less about doing practices to grow and mature in God and more about saying yes to what God is doing in us through the circumstances of our life and in particular, what God is doing through our pain, which in Peter's case would be his death. Church tradition has it he was crucified upside down by the Roman Empire. For us, it's likely not that extreme, but it could be any number of things. It could be your singleness, or it could be your marriage, or your divorce, or the death of a dream, or the loss of a loved one. It could be anything. Now, in the words of Haruki Murakami, what we talk about when we talk about this inner dynamic is what down through church history has been called active spirituality and passive spirituality. That language is likely new to you, don't feel bad at all, and you don't need to remember this for later. It's ancient language, not modern. As you all know, the word passive has negative connotations in modern English. I hear the word passive, and I think of passive aggressive. I was just on the East Coast, where they are just aggressive aggressive. <laughs> but here on the West Coast, we, are, we prefer passive aggressive. We're just as mean, but we, we say the mean things in a nice, manipulative voice, you know? Or I think of a passive personality, as in someone who doesn't take initiative in life and chase after a dream. But our spiritual ancestors don't mean it that way at all. For them, passive spirituality is a good thing, not a negative one. Now, much is said in the modern Western church, of which we are a part, about active spirituality. We don't call it that anymore. We don't use that language. We call it discipleship or church. But even then, we do hear people say, oh, she's very active in her church, or he's very active in his discipleship. Beautiful. But very little is said anymore about passive spirituality. 
And this second dimension, it's like it's been paved over kind of by Western culture's obsession with upward mobility and a life that is trending up and to the right, which is tragic because it is a key idea in spiritual formation. And honestly, it's really done a lot to shape the way I follow Jesus. So I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, but I think this simple concept has the potential to open you up to a new layer of transformation in Jesus. To start off, let's, let me just define terms. Active, what our spiritual ancestors mean by active spirituality is the aspects of our apprenticeship to Jesus where it feels like we do something. This is psychological language, not theological language. It feels like self-effort empowered by grace. The psychologist and spiritual director Gerald May, who's done some really good work on this, explains it this way. The active dimension of the spiritual life consists of what feels like one's initiative, choice, or effort. So active spirituality is things like the practices, also known as the spiritual disciplines. You wake up early, maybe not this morning, but you wake up early, you read your Bible and pray in the quiet, or you practice Sabbath, or you come to church, or you practice generosity, or it's living in community, uh, church on Sunday, or you start a table community in your home, and you eat a meal with other Christians, or you are at Alpha on Tuesday night. It's learning. You read a book, or listen to a teaching, or a podcast, or take a class to fill your mind with new information. You could argue it's therapy, where you make an appointment, and you get there, and you put yourself in the chair, and you open yourself up in vulnerability, and you explore your past, your present, and your future. It's what my Calvinist friends call mortification. You gotta love the Calvinists. Any of you in the room, you, you know how to name things. Mortification, as in to mortify or kill sin in your body. Paul called it to crucify the flesh. It's so most of the work that I do with practicing the way. With active spirituality, it feels like we're in charge. Just meaning it feels like if, if I don't do it, it won't happen. I got up early this morning to read scripture and pray before Gare, the extrovert, interrupted me. And <laughs> at a theological level, I'm happy to say that was a work of grace. But at a psychological level, it felt like I set my alarm. And I got up early rather than sleep in, and I made some really bad coffee, and I sat down to pray the Psalms. And that's what it feels like with active spirituality, like you're the one doing it. It's goal-based. We often have a success, a kind of sense of success or failure. It's more of a linear journey. We often feel like we're moving forward or not. You could say that active spirituality is our responsibility. It is our part in our spiritual formation. More on that in a few minutes. But active spirituality is only one dimension of our spiritual formation. There's a whole other one. Passive spirituality is the aspects of our apprenticeship to Jesus where it feels like God is doing something in us with or without our cooperation. Again, May writes, the passive dimension seems to be more initiated and carried out by God. Now, there is a positive side of passive spirituality, what in the charismatic tradition is called encounter, where you're at a gathering like this, or you're alone in your room, or you're on a mountaintop, and you're waiting on God, and you encounter the power of the Spirit of God. There's the omnipresence of God, and then at a theological level, there is the manifest presence of God, where the, the presence of God, the power of God is manifested in your mind, in your body, in a community. And there's the healing of your body, or you experience uh, healing at an emotional level of an inner wound, or deliverance from de demonization. All of this is out of your control. You can't practice an encounter with God. You can't practice a miraculous healing. You can't schedule it into your rule of life. All you can do is set your body before God and wait in faith. But usually, with passive spirituality, it's things that are not only out of our control, but are against our will. Things like, above all, pain and suffering. It's disease, it's death, it's the loss of a loved one, it's failure or betrayal or wounding or bankruptcy or humiliation. Wherever that comes from, 
And there are different opinions on that across the stream of the church of Jesus. Whether it comes from God or your own bad decisions or the evil one or whatever, set that aside for a moment. God often does his best work through it. It's also things like accepting our limitations due to the season of our life, whether that's singleness or marriage or young children or midlife or retirement or residency or whatever, startup culture. It's things like calling. At times, if not often, God will call you and I to things that we do not want. Has that been your experience yet? Whether you are nodding your head is a great outward sign of how far you are into the discipleship journey. Trust me, it will be. Henry Nouwen, who has a beautiful reflection on this chapter, John chapter 21, defines spiritual maturity as the willingness and ability to be led where you would rather not go. Are you willing and are you able, those are, by the way, two separate things, to be led where you would rather not go? I used to say, and a little bit of vulnerability, this is not a way to win you over, but I used to say, I love to visit LA, but I would never want to live here, <laughs> never. I remember saying to a friend, I think LA would be the most difficult city in America to pastor. <laughs> Care Jones, what have you gotten in me into? <laughs> but to quote my mentor to me when we were in the discernment process, he said, John Mark, who in the Bible ever liked their calling? Ah, uh, shoot. With passive spirituality, it feels like God is in charge, not us. Like it's out of our control and against, again, often against our will. It's not goal-based. There's no like, hey, my goal for 2023 is three medium light, six week bouts of suffering that specifically target my chronic anxiety and miscalibrated nervous system and are designed to increase my trust in God by about 20 to 25%. <laughs> Put it in my annual, like, no, you would never think that way at all. It's not linear. In fact, you often feel like you are regressing, not progressing, like you're falling apart, not getting your act together. And we usually have no clue what Jesus is even doing through our pain. It's obscure. It's like it's hidden from our field of vision until later when we have the gift of insight. And there's that, ah, I see now God was dot, dot, dot. And our responsibility is really just to welcome God's work in trust and gratitude rather than resist it or rebel against it. So active and passive spirituality. A few thoughts on the implications of this very simple paradigm for your discipleship to Jesus. First, active spirituality is really important. One of the reasons so many American Christians feel disillusioned and discouraged about their faith is because they simply have not been informed in their part in their spiritual formation. We've been fed this steady diet of messaging with things like, it's not about what you do, it's about what's been done for you. Just to clarify, that idea may be true or not, depending on how you nuance it. That is certainly not a line in the teachings of Jesus or the writings of the New Testament. Jesus told us to do all sorts of things, starting with, follow me, which just to clarify, is something you do. <laughs> and it is something that God does in you. But that bifurcation is wildly unhelpful. The practices, for example, or the spiritual disciplines like Sabbath, solitude, church, a meal in community, fasting, prayer, they, they are not everything, but they are really, really important. They don't get you to the end of the spiritual journey, but they certainly are the beginning and the middle and the train tracks that we travel. They are not the journey itself. They are how we set our life on the path or the way for the journey. And we offer up our whole life, including our body, to God to heal and save and free and transform. But this is our part. God will not practice Sabbath for you. God will not turn off your phone. 
God will not start your day in the quiet. God will not work in you a decision to watch less TV at night and instead to go to bed early and get up to pray. God will help you. God will give you grace. But you are a human being created in the image of God. And the part of the staggering beauty of what it means to be made in the image of God is the responsibility that you carry to steward your life. There are very few people that steward their life well. The few that do, we, the Tim Kellers of the world, that we, we rightly admire them and applaud them because freedom is incredibly difficult to steward. But under the grace of God, what's possible in the growth of the human soul is hard to put into words. The ancients called it sainthood or holiness. But these things, practices, stuff we need to do, it's our part. St. Augustine famously said in the fourth century, without him, we can't, but without us, he won't. Many of us are waiting around for like the zap from heaven. I call it the matrix theory of spiritual formation. <laughs> it's like, remember that scene when, this is old school, but whatever generation you are, matrix one, downhill after that, matrix one, can we agree? Goodness. Neo and Trinity are on the roof, and they're getting chased by Mr. Smith, right? And, and they, they need it out, and there's a helicopter waiting there, I think because they killed everybody. I can't remember. And, and, but she doesn't know how to fly a helicopter, and so she does the little, you know, inner ear radio thing. Tank, I need a download for a Huey, da-da-da-da-da. And then her eyes, she's like, just a minute. He types into his little old-school keyboard, and then her eyes flutter, and she's like, got it! And then she gets in the helicopter, and they, like, peel, and she's this master pilot. It's amazing. That's basically how charismatics approach spiritual formation. <laughs> God, I, I, I need a download for patience. Just bah, you know, whatever. <laughs> Wait for the eyes to flutter and boom, I'm now a patient person. <laughs> How's that working for you? And none of that is said to disparage the power of encounter, which I believe in with every bone in my body. But mostly the power of encounter is about getting unstuck, not moving forward. It's about freedom, it's about healing, it's about breakthrough. Imagine if I uh, was dying of cancer and I was also out of shape. This is an off-the-cuff analogy that I'm right now realizing I should not have used. <laughs> if I were to experience miraculous healing, that would enable my body to then grow and thrive and live on. But if I want to get in shape, I need to like go to the gym still. It's a both and. It's not one or the other. All that to say, active spirituality, our part in our formation and discipleship is incredibly important. But secondly, Active spirituality will only take you so far. What many people find is, you know, let's say you come on Alpha or you come to Focus and you find yourself believing in Jesus, as N.T. Wright once put it. You come to disciple or apprentice under Jesus. You become a Christian. If all you do is basically come to church and do the basic American-style Christian stuff, you will, in your spiritual journey, move from point A to B, C, D or so. But what many people find is at that point, they start to plateau or they get stuck in their formation. But if you practice the way of Jesus, if you begin to take active spirituality very seriously, if you slow your life down, it's mostly not about doing more, it's about doing less. It's about subtraction far more than it's about addition. If you slow your life down, if you begin to Sabbath and read scripture and spend time in prayer and live in community and maybe you start therapy, you serve the poor, you bear witness to the gospel with your life, so on and so forth, you will often find you move forward from D to, I don't know, M-N-L-O-P. You begin to really get traction and really move forward into spiritual maturity and it feels great. You get unstuck. But often go down the path a few more years or however long, 
at that point in the journey, same thing. We're often much farther down the path, but we get a little stuck again once we get to the really deeply ingrained stuff in our heart. From there, we need passive spirituality to transform us at the really deep layers of our being where we are most broken and most in bondage to what Father Thomas Keating called our emotional programs for happiness. Calvinists, again, second mention, call them our idols. Psychologists call them our attachments. Whatever you want to call them, they are all of the things. You have them, I certainly have them, that we think and feel that we need to be okay. Our attachments are not the same thing as our desires. They are the desires that we emotionally cling to that we feel we need to be happy and at peace. And they are the root of our trouble. They are where we are most in bondage because they cause us to be fearfully self-absorbed and they sabotage love. And this whole thing is about love because the moment someone gets in the way of our attachments, you and I will, I do this all the time, inevitably hurt them, or bully them, or manipulate them, or shame them, or violate them in some way in order to get what we feel we want and we need to be okay. Hence, one way to frame the entirety of the spiritual journey in the way of Jesus is as a journey from, in the language of the New Testament, slavery to attachment to freedom to love. Let me flesh this out for you with just a very few, a few very common examples. Marriage. Uh, we just are about to celebrate 21 or 22? 22. 22. We're at that spot where you forget exactly. As long as I am in slavery to my attachment of an ego ideal of what my marriage or my lovely wife should be to Put another way, as long as I am emotionally in bondage to an idealized vision of marriage and of my wife, and I need it to come true to be happy, I am not free to love my marriage or my wife for what it actually and who she actually is. I am in slavery to a fantasy, not free to enjoy the reality as a gift of God. And as a result, not only am I unhappy, that's the least of my problems, I hurt the people I am most called to love. Parenting, we have three kids, or we did yesterday afternoon, hopefully we still, they're next door. You hear nothing or you hear really bad news, that's how it works when your kids are in youth. Three teenagers, your statement last night, Joe, about you would not want a church of all teenagers, that is wisdom right there. No, they're great. But as long as I am in slavery to my attachment to an ego ideal for my children, right? I had so many goals for my children when we started. Man, if, if parenting was planning, I'm the best dad you've ever known. I had their whole life script written out. They were going to do all the things that I wish I had done and my parents had done for me. 4.0, Stanford was just, of course, PhD for at least one of them, just basically to prop up my fragile identity as a wannabe dad of elites, but not really. <laughs> I grew up camping, sorry. <laughs> as long as I need that to be happy, I'm not free to love my children as they actually are. What happens if, hypothetical scenario, my oldest son is lovely, he's wonderful, um, but that guy could care less about good grades in school more than anything. I don't think Stanford's going to happen. <laughs> right now we're just fasting and praying for a high school diploma. So let's start <laughs> there. And he's a lovely kid. He's just not the one I had in my, in my mind. So am I going to harm him, bully him, yell at him? project my anxiety on him and attempt to control him? Or am I gonna walk with him, and love him, and speak truth to him, but honor his imago Dei, his freedom? 
single people. Forgive the last two examples. All sorts of ways to apply this. As long as you are in slavery to your attachment to the ego ideal of fill in the blank, it could be marriage, it could be your body, it could be your dream job, it could be your dream career success, whatever it is, you are not free to love the body or the state of relationship or the job or the city or the friend group or whatever that you actually have. At some point, we all have to face the reality of our life with a heart that is not only at peace, but is full of joy. This is my body. Okay. This is my marriage. All right. This is my singleness at age. Okay. This is my story. This is my relationship with my dad. This is my wound. This is my career. This is my success or this is my failure. Okay. Can you imagine if we were to calmly hold reality in our mind and be at peace? We do this by a shift of the heart from, in the language of the New Testament, slavery to freedom or in modern vernacular, from attachment to detachment. One teacher I love, Robert Mulholland, defines detachment in the way of Jesus as a deep inner posture of joyful release of our life and being to God in absolute trust, without demands, without conditions, without reservations. It is neither a passive resignation nor a fatalistic acquiescence to whatever comes. It is rather a consistent posture of actively turning our whole being to God so that God's presence, purpose, and power can be released through our lives into all situations. That's it. Detachment in the way of Jesus is very different, to clarify, from in the Buddhist tradition. The goal for us as followers of Jesus is not to detach from all desire. Desire is like the engine in your life built there by God to drive you forward into the world. It's to reorder your desire to, in the language of Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God, where Jesus his rule, his reign, his presence, that is the driving desire of your heart. Everything else is what it is. Some things can only be said in poetry. I love this from St. John of the Cross, Spanish, 16th century. To reach satisfaction in all, desire satisfaction in nothing. To come to possess all, desire the possession of nothing. To arrive at being all, desire to be nothing. I love this even more from St. Teresa. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing make you afraid. All things pass, but God is unchanging. Patience is enough for everything. You who have God lack nothing. God alone is sufficient. That's detachment. Or in the language of Jesus, that is freedom to love. God, other people, your own life, and even yourself in a healthy Christian sense of that statement, as it actually is, whatever your circumstances. But, and here's the point I'm trying to get to, this capacity of the heart to hold your life this way, I am certainly not there, is mostly developed through passive spirituality, not active. This is likely not going to happen by another exegetical Bible study through Romans, which I am all for. But that's likely not how this is going to happen in your heart. That can give you a vision of what's possible. It's likely not going to do the work. It's mostly something God does in you and me through circumstances that are out of our control, mostly through suffering, not something that we do through spiritual disciplines or whatever. It mostly comes through our pain. All that to say, active spirituality is great, 
but to progress, we must embrace both dimensions. A few much shorter thoughts before we turn to prayer. Number three, we progress on the spiritual journey by a simple combination of the two. Listen to this from Jean-Pierre de Cassade, French Jesuit, 17th century, beautiful. He, he developed this whole theory of what he called sanctity, kind of his time's word for um, spiritual formation. He writes this, it's a bit dense, but it's incredible. Would to God that all men could know how very easy it would be for them to arrive at a high degree of sanctity, a high degree of spiritual maturity. They would only have to do this, to fulfill the simple duties of Christianity, we would just say basic discipleship, active spirituality, and of their state of life, your mom, you're a single person, you're a retiree, whatever, and then to embrace with submission the crosses belonging to that state and to submit with faith and love to the designs of providence. The passive part, there it is, of sanctity, spiritual formation, is still more easy since it only consists in accepting that which we very often have no power to prevent. And I love this turn of phrase, suffering lovingly. That is to say, with sweetness and consolation, those things that too often cause weariness and disgust, once more I repeat, in this consists sanctity. Simplifies the whole journey of spiritual formation down into one paragraph. It's a bit dense, but one paragraph. Practice the way of Jesus and accept the pain and suffering that you cannot control. Number four, as a general rule, the first half of life is more active and the second is more passive. We see this in Jesus' words to Peter, when you were younger, all the active verbs, and when you are old, all the passive verbs. I think for most of us, that is the progression as we age. It's intermental. It's not like a dramatic shift at whatever age. It's over time. Those of you who are younger, you, your focus is likely, and this is right, not wrong, on learning the practices of Jesus and developing a rule of life and getting into therapy and learning relational skills and emotional skills and discovering your identity and calling, who you are, what you're meant to do, your purpose in life, and then chasing after your dreams and building a family or a career or life or legacy, whatever it is, all good. Those of you who are a bit older, have likely done a lot of that work. It's okay if you've not, but most of you likely have. Now your focus is on the great task of the second half of life, forgiveness. Ronald Rollheiser writes about how there are four dimensions to forgive, four things that all of us must forgive if we are to die free. One, other people who've hurt us, wronged us, betrayed us, lied about us, abused us. To ourself for being stupid, <laughs> making bad decisions, putting ourselves in situations where we were hurt. Three, life for just not being fair. It's just so not fair. And then he writes, God for not saving us from it all. He doesn't mean that we actually need to forgive God. That's silly. He just means it's just an emotionally honest statement. There are times when you have to just let go of anger against God because your life hasn't gone the way you wanted. But that statement is true for every single person in this room, but it's a lot more true for those of you who are 53 than those of you who are 23. No matter your stage, active and passive spirituality, it's always a both and. You never mature beyond active spirituality. Steph Curry is still doing dribbling drills. You never mature beyond it. But as we age, we realize more and more that God is in charge of our spiritual formation, not us. Life becomes less about activity and more about acceptance. The novelist Nikos Kazantakis tells this story in his memoir about going to see an elderly monk named Father Macarius when, uh, when Nikos was a young man. And he was thinking about becoming a monk, he never did. But he asked him, Father Macarius, you're old, do you still wrestle with the devil? And Father Macarius said, no, son, I, I have grown old and he has grown old with me. We're both too tired. <laughs> and then he said, I no longer wrestle with the devil, I wrestle with God. 
And young Nico said, you wrestle with God and you hope to win. And he said, no, my son, I hope to lose. The older we get, the more we wrestle with God. Why has my life worked out this way? Why did that dream come true, that promise that you put in my heart, and this one just crashed and burned? Why did I invest 20 years of my life in this marriage, and now it's just heartbreak, littered pieces across the floor? God, we wrestle with God. And we hope not to win, but to lose. Not to grasp for control, but to let go, to accept the reality of our life and learn to find joy in the goodness of what is. Finally, acceptance is not acquiescence. I imagine it's easy to hear this and worry, you know, won't this passive spirituality lead to pacifism, to kind of lazy fatalism where you just kind of sit around? Not if you grasp it right. My therapist calls it active acceptance, meaning we're active. You do everything you can to control the outcomes of your life, and then you accept all of the things that you cannot control, which, if you haven't figured this out, is most things. <laughs> One study in the UK recently found that the average person has 15% of the control over their life they think they do. Mm -hmm. That 85% is why we have therapists right <laughs> there. We all face problems in life a constant stream of them. We err in our spiritual journey if and when we focus more on external solutions than internal solutions to our problems. If we focus and put most of our energy into how we manipulate the people and circumstances of our life to make us happy again, then on how to become the kind of person who is happy no matter the circumstances. Life then, if you don't do that, just becomes one giant game of whack-a-mole. You fix one problem and another one pops up. One problem and another one problem. One problem, you're just thinking, if I can just get there. And all the old people tell you, it's not, there's no there, it's death, it's not coming. But we don't believe them. We just think, I can create utopia, I can get there, I can get satisfaction or whatever it is. But I'm all for problem solving, it's great. But sooner or later, we have to realize that most of our deepest problems can't be solved. They can't be fixed. They can only be forgiven, healed, embraced, accepted. It takes discernment to know when to fight for the right outcome and when to surrender and open to God. May God give you wisdom. Now, to wind down, just to close, um, how do we incorporate this? into our life, busy weekend, a lot of activity. How do we do this? In the therapy world, there's this saying um, that you hear people say a lot, do the work. You familiar with that? So people that have been in therapy will say, oh, she, she's done the work. Pastors say this a lot, and that means like they're a safe person to put in leadership. But you also hear people say, oh, he, he's not done the work. And they're like, no, don't touch that thing with the 10-foot pole, right? And that language can, can often be really off-putting to Christians. Um, in particular, those of us from streams of the church, where there's a lot of beautiful emphasis on Christ's finished work on the cross. Aren't we saved by grace, not by works? When you listen carefully to what people are actually saying, for the most part, what people mean by do the work is just slow down and make space to sit with your pain, whatever it is, and follow it all the way down to Jesus, because he's waiting there for you at the bottom of it. I know this weekend is full of activity, which is great, but if you have any Sabbath time, any quiet time, or you and a close friend go on a hike or a walk, here's an idea. You could reflect a little bit on what does active spirituality look like in your life? Are there practices that Jesus is inviting you into or anything you feel an inner prompt from the spirit of Jesus to go and do? But you could also reflect on your passive spirituality. You could just start by naming the pain points. One of my favorite questions to ask in spiritual direction is where does it hurt? Not just in your body, but in your soul. Because when you read the gospels, Jesus usually comes to people where it hurts. He usually comes to people in their pain. 
comes to Mary Magdalene in her demonization, to Bartimaeus in his blindness, to the woman with the flow of blood in her chronic illness. In story after story, he meets people in their pain. That is still where Jesus meets people. You will find all sorts of reasons not to do anything that I just said, <laughs> especially in LA. You know, they say pain is the great teacher, but our culture has developed incredibly sophisticated methods for numbing our pain. Not just physical pain, emotional pain, mental pain, relational pain, spiritual pain, all of it. And like, in all honesty, that's one of the main reasons I did not want to move to LA. It's such a first half of life city. And America as a whole is a first half of life culture. It's very true. And stereotypes are both dishonoring and very helpful. And, um, you know, in the same way that there's a stereotype of the Brits, not these Brits, but all the other ones on the island as being emotionally reserved and prim and proper. Stereotype of New Yorkers as just being mean. Um, there's just, no, I'm just kidding. Those of you from New York, sorry. There's a stereotype of surfers as being laid back. You all know this, like the stereotype of Southern Californians is just incredibly superficial. Just to clarify. <laughs> I'm just here to win you over, compliment you, endear myself to you, make you feel loved, you know? Um, and it's a first half of life city and that's the beauty of it. People come to this part of the world to chase a dream to drink up the pleasure of life, to make it, to go after the impossible. That's what makes it so fun and dynamic and diverse and beautiful. But the shadow side is, it's also what makes it so shallow. Because the focus of the culture, and again, this is true of America overall, is on the external, not the internal. On success, not failure. On up and to the right, let's keep that train rolling, not on what Henry Nouwen called downward mobility in the way of Jesus. It's on the active, not on the passive. And that's fine, especially for those of you who are younger. May God give you grace to chase after all the dreams that he's put in your heart with full blessing. Just know, it's never up and to the right for very long. And there are whole layers below the surface where Jesus is waiting to transform you. And I'll end with this, really this time. One exercise I use with people on retreat is this paradigm, which I adapted from Dr. Larry Crabb as a Christian psychologist. If you imagine your life in kind of layers, the top layer, you have the surface life, where your entire life focus is just, man, I want to look and feel good. Welcome to LA, people. <laughs> right? That's where most people live, that band. It's on your image, your career, success, hedonism, materialism, your body, whatever, all the external stuff. But again, no life arc is always up and to the right. If it's ever up and to the right, at some point, inevitably, we fall down and we get wounded. And we slip below the surface into what you could call the wounded life. Now, most of us at that point, our focus is on a very simple question. How do I get back to looking and feeling good? Take me back up. I want to feel happy again. I want my life to be right again. I want my circumstances to be right again. Okay. But that's whack-a-mole. It's only a matter of time until you're back down. The invitation of Jesus is not to go up and out, but down and in. To meet him in your pain and accept his invitations there to be transformed to look for God in all of the circumstances of your life that you cannot control. Wherever they come from, whether it's God or some malevolent force, either way, he's waiting there for you in your pain. The invitation is to a deeper layer, what you could call the formation life, where now our driving cash question becomes, what is God wanting to do in and through this pain? So have a great weekend. Have a blast. There's spicy game night tonight. Y2K, have a blast. Do all the things, go to the bonfire. But, but if you happen to get a little moment, I would just sit with that question. 
What is God? Just draw to the surface of your heart your pain. We all have it. Eh, there's no one in this room that doesn't have it. Just sit in that. Don't numb it. Don't distract it. Don't deny it. Don't run away. Don't spiritualize it. Just hold it there before God. And just ask that question, God, what do you want to do in and through this? How do you want to form me into a person of love and joy and peace in the image of Jesus? That's a really good question. Let's stand together and pray.